good morning everyone this is asif here uh, i'm the host for the evening for today's uh, webinar series uh, i'm just waiting for more people to join so give me a couple of more minutes uh, once we have uh, more audience then we can get started so just hold on for some time uh, people are signing up i can see that Yeah, in the meantime, if you have any specific questions, there is a Q&A tab. Or you can type in your questions in the Q&A tab. So we'll just wait for another couple of minutes uh, for us to get started. Yeah, see, we're based out of India, so I would say uh, Bangalore. Oh yeah, I see a lot of more people joining in. Yeah, for, for those who joined a little late, I'm waiting for more people to sign in. So once we go. Oh, yeah, there's one more Q&A. Uh, they, they're asking how long is the session today? Yeah, uh, yeah. It will be one hour. The session is going to be for one hour. Yeah, I think we can get started right now. It's uh, already three minutes past our scheduled time. So um, welcome to Prodigy uh, series, webinar series. I'm Asif, I'm your host for the evening. Uh, today's session is going to be totally for an hour. Uh, first 45 minutes is going to be the product introduction and the product demo. And the last 15 minutes is going to be the Q&A. And the topic for today's uh, webinar is uh, Automotive Ethernet Protocol Analyzer. and uh, to speak about this uh, topic, uh, uh, the speaker for the evening is Godfrey Kohlo. So let me give a brief background about Godfrey. So Godfrey has uh, 25 years of experience in test and measurement domain. Uh, he was a member of uh, HP Agilent team early, then later on he moved to Tetronics. And for the last 10 years, he's been running Prodigy Technovations, which is uh, delivering products uh, like protocol anal analyzers for I2C, SPI, uh, EMC, UFS, and so on, right? So you know, what I'm going to do is, uh, before I hand over a couple of things, uh, there's a Q&A tab here. So please feel free to ask any questions when you have, or you can even raise your hand and uh, you know we will connect with you directly to ask any questions. So I'm going to hand over to Godfrey. Um, he is going to take the session and uh, do the demo for you. Please. Godfrey, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Asif. Uh, good morning, all of you. Um, so today agenda is that we'll have a couple of slides on Prodigy Technovation because we may be very new to many of you, uh, just to give you an idea what we have been doing and what's the team size. And we just give a quickly overview of automotive in vehicle bus network. It's mainly to get a warm up and to know, okay, this is how we have been doing and where we are heading. And uh, overview about automotive ethernet interface uh, the needs automotive ethernet industry needs, like uh, what are the testing challenges mainly in automotive ethernet industry, 
and how Prodigy Technovations uh, product PGY 100 base T1 is uh, solving those uh, issues and uh, how it helps you and then followed by a short demo. So <clears throat> about Prodigy, we are based out of Bangalore in India. That's the only location we are currently located. Uh, we started in year 2009 with uh, developing application software for Tektronix Oscilloscope. So during the time when we were in, during this phase, right, uh, we're developing application, uh, when we are discussing with the customers, we realized that the scope-based protocol analysis tools are not providing in-depth information. So customers wanted to capture the data for a longer period of time and analyze it. And in the year 2014, we started developing EMMC protocol analyzer, and we launched that in 2015. And this product was well received by many of our customers and there on our journey started with developing our own standalone protocol analyzer. So we have a range of products today. So currently the team size is around 39 people and we have a two business verticals. Uh, most of the team is almost 90% of the team is working on a product development uh, for different technologies. We also do a, some sh small distribution in India of American pro pro company products. So our customers are all, uh, most of the, our customers are semiconductor companies and some of them are systems companies. Uh, we have a Intel, Qualcomm, Hewlett Packard, Sony, Sandisk, Microchip, uh, NXP. Uh, some of our list customers like we have a Kioxia, Samsung also, SK Inex, they are all our customers. So coming to the today's the topic of the evening is uh, automotive in vehicle networking and 100 base T1. Just to get started, uh, we can look at any of the vehicles today. There is a lot of uh, electronic, many electronic control units, which are all interconnected using a communication link. And this link can be using a LIN protocol, CAN, CAN FD, FlexRay, most protocol. So there is a lot of data exchange taking place at a certain data speed uh, among these electronic control units. Today we can see something around 60 to 75 plus electronic control units in a vehicle. In a high-end vehicle, there can be many more electronic control units uh, based on the sophistication and the performance of the vehicle. So this is about the mainstream market today. The technology is very widely used. Without a ECU, there may not be a vehicle out there. So the, uh, the current in-vehicle network bus, like the LIN, which is a local interconnect network bus, uh, which is a low cost and it's operated at 19.2 kilobits per second, and it's a single copper cable. It's easy to implement. Mainly this LIN is used by to managing the doors and some of those simple things in the vehicle. And then we have a controller area network, which is a very dominant and most common usually used in the vehicle. It's a more like a deterministic network. It is as a very reliable communication between the ECUs. So the maximum data speed today, it can go up to 15 megabits per second. It's a single twisted pair cable and it's a plug and play kind of application use case. Then for safety critical applications, uh, industry invented uh, FlexRay bus, which is running at 10 megabits per second with uh, uh, redundancy uh, built into it. And then you have a media oriented uh, stream transport, okay? A media oriented streams transport, uh, which is um, actually originally in used for input infotainment bus. And it is running at 2550 and 150 megabits per second. So, so this is a ring topology. So this is kind of a, most bus is very widely used. And now what we are seeing is emerging technologies like Ethernet is slowly getting in uh, in order to address some of the new sensors in the in, wake, uh, in, a, in a vehicle. It is like radars, high speed resolution cameras and network communication in vehicle infotainment system. Uh, so, so in order to support this higher bandwidth, the automotive industry is uh, slowly adopting Ethernet over there. And it is coexisting with the CAN, LIN, and FlexRay, and USB uh, other interfaces uh, over a gateway. Okay, so this is uh, what is emerging. What we are expecting in the future is uh, there will be a very uh, main uh, backbone of Ethernet interface, and uh, it will be connected to different ECUs, which will be doing different functions, 
and we expect can and flex rate to continue to exist or uh, on the on the in the in vehicle bus and there will be different sensors which will be maybe having a very low data rate uh, where they may use 10 base ts 10 base t1 100 base t1 uh, one gig uh, uh, one gig uh, ethernet interface and uh, there are already work is going on our specifications are defined at ieee at uh, 2.5 gig ethernet so this is the direction it is going on and we expect that ethernet will be a very dominant player uh, over a period of time in uh, most of the uh, most of the almost every automotive vehicle now what is driving the industry to adopt uh, this uh, automotive ethernet is uh, more complex applications like you have a autonomous driving uh, which is requires more sensors and the more sensors means more data to be processed and the sensor data to be brought to a central cpu location where this data to be processed so the high speed communication is uh, a link is required and from this CPU, then we have to take actions that data should go out and take some actions. So this whole network becomes a very bandwidth hungry. And then we have a com com complex, like no growing uh, applications like cameras, diagnostic features, and ADAS and infotainment system. And uh, the display uh, console, uh, like you know, computerized centers. So it needs also a higher bandwidth uh, data rate. So that is what driving it. And the other side, in order to keep the cost low, so the cabling also needs to be thought about it. And uh, one of the things are that cable has to be simple to use, easy to deploy, and also less in weight so that performance of the vehicle is maintained. And there has to be very high reliability and extreme uh, at extreme operating temperatures. And the power consumption has to be minimum. Uh, and then there's a compatibility to like you know the scale up the network for the future applications and uh, also at the same time time to market so if you have a, everything on a ethernet it may be it becomes so easy to add an ecu and improve the performance because it's kind of a homogeneous network with a minimum uh, can or flex ray presence over there and then you have a automotive industry standards uh, you have to comply with that so all these are uh, automotive industry needs, which is actually driving the ethernet uh, uh, adoption in the vehicle. So then, we, then it comes to the automotive ethernet, what we see is that uh, the, the first thing which came up with the broader reach. So broader reach was uh, kind of invented, I think by Broadcom and uh, then they gave those specification to IEEE and it was now standardized as a 100 base T1 or a 1000 base T1 uh, Ethernet uh, interface. It's a twisted pair, uh, single uh, twisted pair cable, and uh, it can uh, interface all the ECUs uh, in, a, in a vehicle. Now, how does this uh, overall the physical layer looks like on a 100 base T1? You have a MAC layer, and, uh, and at the physical layer, you have a file layer. And the MAC layer is uh, in uh, interface to the PHI chip uh, using a uh, RGMI or media independent interface, or sometimes maybe at a higher data rate, it may be considered to use SGMI. And at the PHI layer between the two PHI, we will be it is interfaced using a single twisted pair cable, and uh, and it's a full duplex communication. When I, when you say it's a full duplex communication the data between the two uh, ECUs can be exchanged simultaneously at the same time. So virtually we can get a 200 megabits per second throughput, okay? So this is the level of data exchange takes place on a 100 base T1 file layer. Now, what's the difference between a, uh, the, the commercial ethernet and automotive ethernet at a file layer? It is important to understand. So at the, at the broader reach or 100 base T1, uh, we have a single twisted pair cable where it is simultaneously transmitting and receiving 100 megabits of uh, data. And this data is actually transmitted using a PAM3 signaling that is pulse amplitude modulation three. So it means that the signal has a three levels and from this we need to extract the information. And then you have a 4B, 3B encoding, and then other end, you have a media independent interface, okay? 
So this is how Android Base T1 file layer block diagram looks like. Now, if you look at the file layer of Android Base TX, which is a commercial Ethernet, it's also known as a fast Ethernet, which is a two separate twisted pair cables. Okay, and it is a kind of a half duplex. It's like you have a separate transmit line and it's a separate receive lines. So the signaling may be happening on a multi-level uh, signaling and it's a NRS, NRZ with the invert and the 4B, 5B encoding, then media independent interface. The significant difference is, uh, is the level of signaling as well as the, the twisted pair cabling. So by using a single twisted pair cable in automotive ethernet gives a very strong advantage is that the amount of cable required in a vehicle will significantly will come down. And at the same time, uh, we can get a very high data throughput, the full duplex of 100 megabits per second. And this cable can uh, support a length of 15 meters and also it uh, meets a stringent EMI EMC requirement of automotive ethernet. This is the main uh, difference at the physical layer between the automotive ethernet and standard ethernet. Now, when you look at the OSI layers, like you know, the, the layers above the file layer, so we have uh, different uh, uh, layers like automotive ethernet, uh, uh, like 802.3, the VLAN, and, uh, and the precision timing protocol, audio video bridging, uh, some IP, TCP IP, UDP. These are most of the commercially uh, well-defined protocols by the IEEE in the Ethernet domain. And these protocols can be directly used on the 100 base T1 file layer, okay, for different applications. And that makes it uh, more, uh, maybe easy to adopt Ethernet. Uh, once we address the file layer issue, it is easy to adopt Ethernet and develop and build uh, many more applications and, uh, and also, Externally, the vehicle can be connected to the, uh, to the internet much easily because internet is based on more of ethernet domain and there is an easy communication can take place between the vehicle and the external world. So now what are the challenges in terms of analyzing ethernet protocol? So we, we talked about what is driving the uh, adoption of ethernet in a vehicle and uh, what is the advantages and at a very uh, broad level we looked at the difference in file layer as well as in the different osi layers how the protocol stack would look like but now automotive industry is like you no know, very very uh, safety critical and mission critical kind of application where the human life is involved so in order to make this entire network to work uh, reliably uh, the entire automotive ethernet protocol has to be tested thoroughly for different timing parameters because there is certain data is captured and processed and certain application certain action to be taken it creates its own delays so in order to make sure that the timing is met so it is kind of some kind of a very uh, proper analysis needs to be done in a commercial world if you look at it uh, automotive e Ethernet is not a very deterministic network because a packet can take many different routes to reach its destination. But in case of automotive Ethernet, it has to reach at a certain time or period of time. So it has to take as much as shortest path as possible. So then we have to correlate uh, in Ethernet domain what is happening at the file layer with the, some of the sideband signals like MDIO and MDC. And it's a low latency network because it has to take a very quick decision. So we need to capture the events going through in the, in the network and uh, analyze the protocol activity over a long period of time. And it's also make, making it very extremely difficult to extract the master and slave ECU information from the superimposed full duplex PAM3 signal, okay? We will look into it in more detail in the next slides. And then uh, when, when you connect these two ECUs, when you do a power on, there is always a initialization takes place, the line training between the two master and slave ECUs by sending certain packets and making sure that they can recover the data without any problem. So most of the time, uh, this event goes well properly. The rest of the events are quite uh, takes place without much difficulty. So hence, it is important for design engineers to ensure that there is a consistently and repetitive, repetitive performance 
at the initialization uh, time frame. Okay. So now looking at the file layer, like if you look at the full duplex of PAM3 signal uh, by probing a, by an oscilloscope, this is how the signal would look like. Uh, it's a full duplex signal, which is a superimposed to each other. It is extremely difficult or it is, no, it is not possible to know what is being communicated by just looking at the signal. And it's also not possible to know whether this signal is really uh, has any a meaningful content, okay? So that's where when both side signals are simultaneously communicating, there will be uh, addition and subtractions and then the signal would look like this. So we need some kind of an intelligent device to extract the master and slave information from this full duplex PAM3 signal. Now, how does the five chip architecture works is that like you no, know, even five chips also receive the same signal which we just looked at the previous slide, but they need to extract the received signal to process it further. Now, in case of a uh, master phi and a slave phi, if you look at here, the phi will transmit the packets and uh, it will go over the twisted pair cable over to the slave device. And at the same time, the slave would also would transmit the packet and it is received by the master and then it will be processed. Now, what we have is a hybrid circuit which will receive this uh, uh, full duplex PAM3 signal and it will do a, some kind of echo cancellation using the known transmitted signal, okay? Using the known transmitted signal, uh, it will do a echo cancellation and it will receive the data and it will process it further. So since it has a, a transmitted signal, it is easy to process it and uh, take it further and, and analyze it. The some of the most commonly used uh, uh, extracting the information from the master and slave in case of a full duplex PAM3 signal is active tapping. Now, for the simplicity, I have, I have two such examples over here where we have a ECU and the sensors are connected to the ECU using 100 base T1 traffic. And, the, and for the testing purpose, what we are doing here is that we are configuring one of the ECU port as a uh, uh, receive all this data and transmit over a full duplex 100 base T1 uh, uh, file layer or a media converter. The media converter takes this data and uh, transmits over a host computer using uh, maybe a 100 base TX or a one gig line to the host computer to process it further. So this is an active device. So it will take the data and process it. The second type, what we are discussing over is that there may be multiple ECUs and they, then there are sensors are connected to it. And all these signal, signals are tapped to a media converter or something called throughport network. And it is connected to throughport network. The, the throughport uh, uh, converter will receive the 100 base T1 signal and it will extract the information and then it will retransmit back to the ECU and vice versa it will do. So it will, will do this activity for multiple segments between the ECU and, and analyze the data. So this is like a active device which, uh, which works on it and retranspose. It will make and correct the signals or if there is an error package, it can drop those packets. We may miss some information during the analysis of the uh, 100 base T1 traffic. Now, how does a media converter would look like? The media converter will have a 100 base T1 uh, file layer and it will, uh, through the MII interface, you can connect to the fast ethernet, 100 base TX, and then this can go to the host computer. Uh, similarly, a throughput data logging system where the sensor input will come to a 100 base T1 port and it is tapped to a buffer and then, uh, using a 100 base TX or a one gig ethernet, commercial ethernet, the data is uh, pushed to a data logger and it is analyzed further. So what we observe is that there's a lot of active circuit is involved and there are buffers involved. Depending on the amount of data coming in, the buffer can overflow and there can be uh, it, its own latency may be being added. And sometimes it, due to the errors in the file layer packet, the data may be filtered out and it may not be seen at the protocol and uh, while analyzing the protocol, uh, there was such an error packet was present. So these are the, some of the limitations 
uh, which uh, active type methodology is posing to the debugging engineers. Now, what's the other, another alternate method of debugging the uh, 100 base T1 uh, traffic is that using the RF directional couplers, okay? So RF directional couplers are the passive devices. So one port of the ECU, master ECU is connected to the directional coupler. And also similarly, the slave ECU is connected. So both will be exchanging the packets. The directional coupler separates the, uh, ECU, the slave packet and give it on a one port. And similarly, it will separate the master packet and give it on a second port. Now by this, you will be like, no, it will consume a less energy of the signal and it, you can, without any uh, active circuit, we will be able to see these signals on two different ports, okay? Now, once the output of the directional coupler is uh, shown here, so what we have seen is that in the previous slide, a completely full duplex superimposed FAM3 signal, which is very difficult to interpret. Now, once we pass that signal through the directional coupler, so what we can see the output is a, a well-leveled uh, PAM3 signal, which has a minus one, zero, and plus one levels, and which can easily be interpreted for a further analysis, okay? So this is a kind of analysis we can do now using the PAM3 signaling. Now, what we have here is that a full, uh, what to give you more clarity about it, we have a full duplex PAM3 superimposed signal uh, goes through the directional coupler, and then uh, the output is shown here on the PAM, PAM3 uh, on the oscilloscope, how the signal looks separate. And once these signals are separated, uh, it can be further processed by digitizing the signal for uh, and using some digital signal processing to extract the uh, logic levels like uh, minus one, zero, and plus one to uh, do the protocol analysis. Now, the other, uh, another issue which customers or people are facing, engineers could face while processing the automotive ether network is it's a low bus utilization. So there are not continuous packets are going on the, over the bus. There will be like master will send some packets and there will be an idle pattern. And after some time, few milliseconds or microsecond, you may see a next packet. So in a normal data acquisition system, so you will be continuously acquiring all these packets, even if you use a passive tapping, and you will fill your memory instantaneously and capturing very few number of packets. Now you need a smart and intelligent device which will take all the data, but then it will save the all the, uh, only the relevant information which is required to do a protocol analysis by removing the idle packets or some of the information which is not required and then still maintain the timestamp with a very high resolution, okay? Now, you have sideband signals along with the file layers and these sideband signals have an influence on the protocol packets on the 100 base T1. So it is important to simultaneously view them, uh, so the sideband signals along with the uh, main 100 pro protocol packet so that you can correlate what is going on in the sideband signal and its influence on the 100 base T packets, okay? So, so this is what we, we can do. And the next requirement again is that the how much, what's the duration of the protocol analysis we can do? Because if you really look at the applications of the automotive vehicle is that it has to go, we, we take the vehicle drive for over a long period of time. It go through different extreme weather conditions. It can go through a desert and a cold weather condition. And uh, how does the automotive ethernet network performs during these changing weather conditions? So that entire analysis needs to be done by, uh, by collecting the data over a long period of time. So one can really uh, analyze it uh, further. And there is also like a lot of different radiation conditions, like you no know, in the open environment, it will be exposed how it is withstanding, how the packets are getting corrupted, and then mapping that with maybe a geography and trying to understand with the timestamp, you know exactly, okay, what went wrong, what place of the time, and analyzing that. So in order to achieve this kind of a, 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 a long uh, capture and analyze it, so you need a tools which can consistently capture over a long period of time, 
and analyze it okay so these are some of the demands in the vehicle so this is the introduction in the meantime i see some questions there maybe uh, we can take some of the questions which are relevant before i talk about the product uh, one of the questions you have is do any of the current network buses also supply power on the same copper uh no i think uh, we none of the uh, automotive ethernet uh, supports right now power over ethernet okay so there is only a packets of data which i am aware of 100 base t1 ieee standard never talks about that okay and uh, let me see is there any other questions uh, no i think uh, we, we let me talk about the product so so the products what we have here is that we prodigy technovation the 100 base t1 pa uh, one of the unique feature here is that what we are talking about the passive tapping which i uh, discussed in detail earlier it's a non intrusive method and it's a monitoring the 100 base t1 so we have a built in directional coupler inside the protocol analyzer which separates the signals and then further processes it to extract the uh, logic levels like a minus one, zero, and plus one, then process it further. Then you also have a product, uh, powerful multiple layer protocol layer trigger capabilities in order to capture the specific events. And also you can do the decoding of DC, TC10 and wake up event between the master and slave. Uh, there is a continuous streaming of the protocol data to the SSD or a hard disk drive of the host computer. So this is one of the biggest advantage what the Prodigy is offering. Uh, product is offering it you can capture it the data for a very long period of time uh, or a ssd in a couple of hours or maybe more and analyze it and then you can do a search and filter care on that data so you we can also do a simultaneous decoding of the 100 base t1 and the sideband signals like mdio and mdc so what we here we have is a test setup uh, how it looks like so the PGY 100 base T1 PA, uh, you can has a, a 100 base T1 ports here. So you can connect the master ECU to one of the ports and the slave ECU to the second port. Uh, internally, they're connected together using a RF directional coupler. A small portion of the energy is extracted and then we will, uh, we will analyze the protocol information. At the same time, we can connect the MDIO, MDS, MDC sideband signals to the protocol analyzer for analysis. Now, if you look at the software which runs on the host computer, uh, which is a very easy to use and it's a commonly used UI here. So you get a timestamp and the direction of the signal, whether the data is going from master or a slave and the IP destination address, IP source, the length of the packet, MAC destination and so forth and uh, uh, FCS information. So you have all this information uh, which is displayed here. And you can also, as I mentioned, simultaneously view the uh, uh, MDIO and MDC packets with the 100 base T1 packets and correlate the, its influence on the 100 base T1 packet. So we have a powerful trigger capability, as I mentioned, there's a simple trigger feature which allows you to define a trigger condition on any layers that is layer two to layer seven. You can simply select the layers and then you can select whether it's a TCP, IPv4, a ERP packet. Accordingly, you can set the parameters and you can set a trigger condition on that. And then you have a powerful real-time uh, advanced trigger capabilities, which is like a state machine based trigger features. You have a if then else if uh, trigger capabilities. So you can monitor for multiple trigger conditions. And at the same time, you can take uh, different uh, trigger uh, actions, okay? So you can go from one layer to another layer. And at the same time, you can monitor for two trigger conditions. So we will be giving a detailed demo also uh, later. And here you have a analytics, like you have a data which is captured, let's say, one hour or two hour, and it's extremely difficult to know, okay, which data has an error and how many of them are different types of packets. So to get this information gives you the, a very good statistical information about master and slave ECUs, 
of different packet information. And then you have a search and filter. You can set different trigger kind of search and filter capabilities uh, available in the decoding software. So this is a, a value proposition. Uh, let me now switch over to the demo. Okay, before I start, uh, let me see if there are any questions here. Uh, okay, I don't see any more questions here. Okay. Okay, so what we have here is, um, let me uh, have a software which is running on a computer. So moment we, um, uh, let me make some settings here. Okay, uh, let me play the uh, video. So you can initially we make the establish the connection. It has a six port, so we can connect with three masters and three slaves. And uh, in this uh, uh, demo, we have connected one master and one slave to port three, and we can simply say acquire, and we till collecting the data, and you get a timestamp information, directions whether it is from the master or a slave packet and uh, other ethernet packet information you can see it the selected packet the protocol description you can see the ethernet frame ipv4 icmp the details so you can go and click on them in the ethernet and you can look at uh, what is the packet content okay and similarly we can look at uh, ipv4 and uh, information in that okay so it's very uh, easy and I think it's a well-known procedure of debugging uh, ethernet packets. The ICMP packets, you can look at here, okay. So, so we have, we can decode ERP, IPv4, uh, TCP IP. So all types of packets uh, we can decode and display uh, what is present in those packets. And what you see here is that the, the blue lines, blue tick marks, they are saying that these packets are all good and uh, they, there is nothing wrong. And here you have analytics. We can see here there are so many Ethernet frames are received. The red uh, alpha number, which is says number of errors, many places it's zero. And we can see two. And we can directly go to those uh, error packets and look at what is going on. And if you are maybe using active tab, sometimes these error packets may not be shown because they may be filtered out because they may not be identified uh, in the in the active device. Okay, so let me now uh, look at the trigger view. So in the trigger, we have a simple trigger. What you can see here, we can trigger any one of those packet contents of a master or slave. Okay. And uh, now we are connected a master uh, three, we are connected and we would like to trigger on uh, a simple trigger on different layer. So we, are, we can select which layer we want to set the content. In this case, we would like to trigger on a layer two. I'm just entering the Mac address and so Mac source and Mac destination address. Set this as a trigger condition and we can review the trigger condition on this summary panel. Just click on acquire and uh, once that event takes place, the protocol analyzer will capture and it will continue to capture. And you can see the pre-triggered data with the negative timestamp and the post-triggered data with the positive timestamp and T is marked at the triggered event. And you can look at this is a MAC destination and MAC source where we are triggered on. And uh, so, so if you really want to trigger on a different layer, we can go to the layer three and we can select IPv, ERP or IPv6 and we can enter those parameters and we can set trigger. Now we also have a advanced trigger capabilities which I talked about. It is if then else if, so we can set different trigger conditions. Uh, if this event takes place or at the same time, there's another event takes, any one of them takes place, go to the next state and do certain, look for another condition. So you can do some complex trigger conditions, very useful for software development team and the former dev development team. So if you have any questions, please start posting it. 
uh, we have uh, almost now another 20 minutes. So we can take your questions. So we can set the trigger conditions at the different layer. So once the uh, trigger condition is set, we can also review that in the summary, uh, because when you do a complex trigger settings, it may, you may, there is a possibility that you may do go something not right. So in order to make sure everything is set up correctly, uh, we can go to the summary view of it, and then uh, we can uh, make the proper settings. Check it, and then we can really uh, click on a, a run button to acquire the data at that particular event. Okay, so we are still entering some numbers here. Uh, if you you can always copy from the main window if you have some data and paste it if, to make it easy to use it. So that's a kind of a flexibility has been provided in this product. So let me let it move forward here. Okay, so here we can review the different uh, trigger conditions. Okay, so once we are all set is correct, then we can go back and uh, uh, start acquiring the data. Okay, so this is our different trigger condition. I'll just click on uh, run. Okay, acquire. And uh, we can go and now look at the protocol view. I'll just go and click so so we can look at, so there are different events which we are defined are taking place and the trigger condition is present here at a slave. So we, so we might have told multiple slave so many times they should come then master event should happen, then slay with the specific address. So any one of those, if then else if trigger condition takes place, so it can, uh, uh, like uh, the trigger takes place. So we have that data now, it will continue to capture and uh, you, you the, the acquisition duration is limited by the uh, the overall uh, host computer the memory capacity. So here we would like to do some file transfer using a TCP protocol. So what we are trying to do is that we try to send uh, one file from one system to another system. And using a, uh, I think a, a messenger. So we just received the packet, we'll open that. And uh, so we'll save it in a location. And once we do that, we can see here, um, this is a file which we are transmitted from that in one system to the another system or a hundred base to one. And we can go and look for that packet. Where is it present? So we may be, this is a large packet. So we have, we have here 1,500 uh, length. So we can see here what we are transmitted A so all the ASCII characters are displayed here. And this is a TCP layer. Uh, so this is a packet which is sent. Now also we can see some TCP packets here. Okay, both to master and slave. And uh, you, you can uh, go and analyze it. So here is the sleep mode, like we run the TC10 test case and we can go see that TC10 command is getting executed and it could go into the high Z, send Z mode. And uh, the protocol analyzer is very easily able to sense that those packets and uh, display it for you. So this is the uh, overall, uh, like you know, different capabilities are available. So we also have a line training analysis capability as it will be uh, available very shortly for you um, once we start shipping the products and you can 
ask for a evaluation unit we will be able to provide you the unit too and then at the end we can generate a report uh, let me just quickly move fast forward so here is a uh, mdio packets at the same time like no mdio packets you can see here uh, read and write things and then we can generate a report give a file name um, all kinds of parameters that's about the report so that's the overall um, uh, uh, presentation uh, i mean uh, overall Uh, demo of the product and uh, if you have the if there is any questions i would like to take this question yeah asif over to yeah you. yeah thanks thanks godfrey for being on time <laughs> i think we are perfectly at 10 45 exactly so i have a couple of questions here uh so basically what is the difference between uh active and the passive tab okay so in case of an active tab there is a active circuit is involved which will actually uh, receive the packet and then it will uh, which is something like you know, recover the data and store it in the buffer and send it to analyzer then it will retransmit the packet okay so in case of a passive tab it is a, a passive circuit which is a based on rf directional coupler technique where the master and slaves are connected together without a, and their communication is not interrupted and a portion of that signal energy is extracted and the signals are separated and then analyzed further okay so the challenges could be in active tap is that it can sometimes drop the error packet because it's not able to process it further and also it can add more delays while processing and also third point is that if the amount of data it is getting in is very very high uh, then what can happen is that um, uh, the, it can overflow the buffer so you may miss packets of data and also it can have a limited capture but in case of a passive like you no know, we are getting everything what is come being communicated by the master and slave and we are digitizing that data and then extracting the logic levels uh, which will give you very good timing resolutions uh, as well as uh, every error packets would be captured and analyzed and uh, and we also can capture it with the prodigy 100 based t1 program for a long period of time and uh, see, uh, what is the capture duration the protocol analyzer can support so i think we are limited by the host computer hard disk so we can capture the traffic for a very long period of time uh, without any problem and uh, also this this gives you a, a very good flexibility to, to capture the data for a very long like you no know, as i mentioned at a different operating condition of the network it could be a desert it could be a cold weather condition and it, it, there could be a certain radiation places while we are going through so so it is limited by the hard disk capacity on the host computer um, so we can capture it maybe for four or five hours or something like that okay okay and uh, i have another question here uh, can we set uh, triggers on osi layers of the ethernet protocol yes we can uh, set trigger on layer 2 to layer 7 anywhere uh, which i showed you in the demo as well as there are a couple of uh, um, ppt uh, slides there so we can go and set those values and trigger on any one of the osi layer and also we have a uh, if then else if advanced trigger capabilities which will enable you to debug uh, further so any more questions people can uh, type in their question questions in the q a tab uh, i'll be waiting for a couple of minutes for some more questions and yeah and godfrey if you have the contact slides you can just share them yeah yeah so uh, if uh, people need any specific questions, you can also write to the, our email ID contact at prodigytechno.com and uh, we'll be happy to answer your questions directly as well. So let me just wait for a minute or two if I see any more questions coming here. So there's a Q&A bar here in the Zoom meeting. So you'll have to go and type in your question there. Or if you want to talk, you can raise your hand. Okay. 
So uh, thanks Godfrey and thanks everyone for joining the webinar. You know, I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and uh, please get in touch in case you have any further questions to our email ID and thank you for participation. So I'm going to end the session here. Yeah, thank you. And there is one question right now. Can I get a copy? Okay, of oh, yeah, sorry, okay. Can we get the copy of the presentation? Yeah, so basically the question, uh, the presentation is getting recorded. So what we will do is our uh, team is going to e uh, email you the recorded presentations. So in case you have missed or in case you want to share it with the people. And, and, and if you want the slides separately, please write to us at contact. Uh, we can also share the PowerPoint slides to you. Okay. Thanks everyone. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for joining. Yeah.